This is IBM Museum. And in this video, I'm going to be going over adding or at least looking at the SRAM because truly it is static RAM. It's on the IBM PC convertible 5140. Um, not just RAM in this case, uh, it's you know effectively static RAM that goes through and saves on that suspend state the, the contents of what you are working on in the system. So when you go through and unsuspend or view it as a kind of a power on with the appropriate battery pack in place, that the system would resume where it left off. Now I've got the LCD removed from this. We're actually gonna go through and add it back on for a reason that I'll get into. Um, and, you know, with that suspend condition, I can't just necessarily uh, power up the system and have it go through to to check all the um, the RAM that's attached to the system as the system boots. Um, just because I don't have effective battery pack in there, and I've got the time set, so it doesn't give me any clock warnings or anything else. At least at this point, when I go through and uh, boot it from diskette. But on a previous video, we did go through and we ran the Microsoft Diagnostic MSD and you know saw the results of this system, which going through and we'll put it in the monochrome mode just like we had before. That's just a way to better see with this video capture the appropriate keys to to press to get the sub windows. It does take, of course, a little bit of time to load by diskette. Okay. And F5 is what goes through and puts it in that effectively that monochrome and we, we see the 512K pressing M goes through and does so that conventional memory toll 512K. And of course, under MS-DOS available space of that as well. I may go through, I will exit out of the MSD program. I do want to bring up the, the page of information. Um, we'll go through and power off the system and add the LCD screen in just a moment here. The, um, and I, I do have, well, yeah, and it's just fine. I'll give the link to the, to the anchor tag within there dealing with the, with the, um, RAM, and I've got to get to where I take the capture off just to be able to go through and to show this um, page. And we'll go through and we'll interact with it. Let me like, go through and move it around a little bit too, just to get the uh, center like it's supposed to be. Let's go through to the interaction. And I'm, of course, clicking on the link. It's got the links there to take you further down to anchors on the page. Um, going through for the, you know, it has the, the section on opening the 5140 that we'll get talking about here, but let's go ahead and just click on the 128 KB link. And that's the same thing I have on the, the monitor that's here in the background as well. And this goes through and I'll show these, these, uh, these modules on screen um just to show the markings and other areas but we do want to kind of scroll up because it talks about um the opening the 5140 that's talking about the, the main unit getting into where the the diskette drives and the and the planners are they aren't talking about the particular aspect and that that'll be it it's on a little included sheet of paper that was with the memory modules that IBM 
um, sold just as showing how to get the unit open. And we'll cover that aspect. So I want to state up front that if you go through this opening of 5140, you're going to get into a, a different area. The, the memory modules for this are held in that keyboard tray. And I'll show how to, to get it up. And in previous videos, I've covered this. I've seen also other videos out there. And I'll kind of complement them in a little bit of way to show um, the, the real aspects of how um, IBM, you know, gave the, the description in a, in a pictograph sheet to, to show how to go through and add the, uh, the modules to it. Now, another area that needs to be addressed, they ha do have the uh, 5140 system unit and, and options, and they list the memory module card there, and then they have a description, and the description is actually a little bit wrong. It's, it's a little bit dated from what people thought. And that is where they talk about the, the PC convertible, the early versions of what they, they state as being limited to just 512K of memory like this unit has behind me. Now, that has had the memory expansion because typically the, the PC convertible, in the announcement letters I've seen, it's listed it as being sold with uh, 256 kilobyte of, of that SRAM. And then um, you can go through and, of course, uh, increase the, the memory amount. But that... I'll show you when we get looking at underneath the, the in the keyboard tray where those modules are of how that came to be just based on the um, what IBM had at the time for the 128 KB modules. And of course, this also shows the 256 KB module that came out later. And I'll even show the third party uh, aspect of the um, going through and, and working with the uh, increasing the RAM um, based on the space that's available there. So let's get this off the screen. I've got a lot of video sources here I have to work with. And I'm going to go through. I will get the internal webcam turned off as well. And I'll get around to where I know I have the full field of, uh, of what's showing on the screen. We're going to go through and um, just in this case, um, let's go through and power down the unit. I'm going to power down the monitor as well. Things are positioned well enough for me to work with, even with this monitor in place. Um, so initially IBM only had the 128 KB module and did not have anything bigger or anything like that, um, at the time of the release of the PC convertible in 1986 inside these boxes, it has this little anti-static and that's kind of important, of course. And here is the. 128 KB module. And it's populated both sides. You'll see this 40 pin header. So it just is daisy chained for the for the memory. And this is actually not marked. It's marked with the option number, but it's not marked anywhere on there for the uh, capacity of the module. And it has, as you know, the uh, Seiko Epson logo on the chips, Seiko Epson Japan logo. And this is kind of important on the, on the PC convertible. Uh, there's also the EEPROMs and the regular, uh, the stack RAM on the planer that's also marked with the Seiko Epson Japan logo. And so in these, Within these boxes, IBM released this little sheet here. 
and we'll try and get it and i thought i even had the scanned at one time i don't i don't see it up i'll have to look and see where i have it okay i guess it is stapled for this i thought it was one big continuous sheet and of course it goes through and shows first number one you go through and you pull the power is what this is supposed to mean this this great picture even though they show all the coin and uh how to um to go through and work with it. I guess that's actually going through and it's using the coin, interesting enough to pull the, that's actually opening the battery compartment up. You're unplugging the, um, the battery connector on the back of the unit and um, showing how to open the cover door. I thought this was accessing the, um, the keyboard tray for a moment. And this coin, I'd, I'd have to see, I'll have to look at, uh, I had, I think, trouble with this particular unit on the on the battery tray, and then it shows here with the the LCD in place. And it shows using a coin for the number two, and how you go through and stick the coin in particular slots to go through and to be able to work the keyboard out of the way. So we're gonna go through here to remember that we're on like number three in the little pictograph. And we're gonna actually put the LCD back in here for a reason. And I, I was saying that my display, the monochrome display was enough out of the way, but I wasn't really entirely correct and just as long as it hangs kind of in the in the regular position um and you pull this bar and you'll actually see the slots here that they show the coin now i was planning to even do this this video a little bit earlier and i kind of went through my pocket i found coins i had pennies and i had even a few dimes and quarters i think i figured out in the past and the penny works good the dime's a little small and I think the quarter is ultimately a little bit too big. And in prior um, timeframes of working with this, I I always thought that the nickel was the appropriate size. And I, um, I didn't have a nickel to work with. And this is actually uh, the nickel I found. <laughs> and of course, this is not the right size. And this is metal this um sort of um of um novelty item or whatever else and of course that yeah like i say that's the wrong side but i did get a nickel today ahead of the video and i don't even know what the date is or anything else uh on that if i can even get it to focus but i i think in my previous observation the, the nickel was about the right was about the right size. And a lot of time I even talked about using the LCD going through and you could you could put the you could put the LCD down and then as you went through and you released the keyboard the LCD actually worked with you to to pull it up. And for this side, let's see if that will go through. And we have to undo the LCD latches, of course. But we're going through. Well, and that didn't pull it up like I'd hoped. So just go through and we'll work with the coin. Okay, so yeah, the nickel, and you have to insert it all the way for ultimately for to, to get um kind of the in the right position so maybe a penny is even a little bit better but it goes through and releases the the catch to the front end of the keyboard and it's held in the back in fact you can uh, the altitude of the of the keyboard actually changes with the uh, with the unit open but the reason that we have the LCD in place is I've seen people struggle with this and try and get this out of the way, or even don't go through and disconnect this this um, 
this ribbon cable, but you can go through with these LCDs. And I'm more familiar with the, um, maybe it's more on the later models. The, the later displays actually have a catch that um, retain that a little bit better. This is just kind of sitting at the angle is how it is being um, held in place. So you probably want to have a little bit more tilt with the older LCD with a single control. Um, I'll show the backlit display, which goes through, um, and that, that'll be my coverage of the LCDs in a later video. Uh, but those later backlit um, LCDs actually hold that a lot better. You just go through and it, it actually kind of almost clicks in place. Now you can see the the tray here and I'll have to go through, I'll probably go through to the point of pausing and moving the camcorder. And that's just so I can get it in better position and um, not go through and hopefully bump anything. Um, but as this shows, this is all the 128 KB modules. And the reason they're the mistaken notion that the unit was maxed out at 512 KB was that you had no more room for a module with four modules in place. And normally they were sold with 256. So half of this tray was filled and you ran out of room. There was hobbyists that went through and they they uh, worked with that, making a 40 pin connector. And if they had a uh, additional 128 KB module, and these are common enough at the time when the convertible was released and they're the highest capacity that you could have, they just went through and they put the additional 128 KB on that ribbon cable and put it somewhere else within that keyboard tray or within the case a little bit better. Uh, to hold that. Now, you want to be careful with these tabs going through and pulling these modules out because these are very brittle and they will break on you. You exert any force, um, even the most gentle handling, it's really a challenge to work with. So I don't know how much I'll necessarily switch these or go through to... And it actually is where shifting the memory card around uh, works in a way to get it loose from these latches. But it, yeah, that's still something that I just, ooh. I don't know if I want to necessarily push going through and adjusting this around them out other than just showing the basic layout. Now, there was third party. There's a simply the best STB and they went through and um, I actually even found an ad for this in an old magazine. They called it the CRAM 384 because it was 384 KB of the same SRAM and it was a longer module. In fact, um, I thought I had a module squirreled away that I could show. I saw one earlier. Okay, I know I have it. So let me go through and pause to get that. Okay, I had it with the other box of items. And this is a bigger module as you can see and it didn't necessarily matter the order that you put these in um, since they are all daisy chained uh, especially when they're the same kind of module but the thought is when you put that 
STB board with the 384 KB of RAM, and SRAM in this case, that it would go through and with the two additional 128 KB modules, you would still have enough room in the tray. Okay, and I guess this doesn't even have, that doesn't have the daisy chain. So this would have to be at the end of the chain. So you'd go through and you'd put it like that at the end of the chain. And that way you'd have the full 640 KB. And just the way that the convertible design um, with the video memory and everything else, 640 KB is actually the true maximum. You can't, uh, you can't really add more um, or the system will not effectively use if you go through and you just string like the 256 KB modules in here, which is the same size. Um, on top of this to to make it more than 640 KB because, um, and I guess that's a, a appropriate way to go into where the 256 KB, this was released later than what the convertible was. And so this finally gave the option from the the pure IBM perspective to go through and to add uh, to be able to reach 640 KB within the um, the unit, and it did include the same um, anti-static, and then the module looks a little bit different, and it's marked with the capacity of the module. And still no markings for IBM. And it also still has those. Can't determine why this thing does not want to focus. Probably just the sheen or something else giving it a hard time. But it does have just those Seiko Epson Japan logos. Nothing marking in as IBM otherwise. And there are pictures of these modules. Of course, the diagram um, on the Arden Tool site showing the size. And I think, as the chips say, they're rated, they're 100, 150 nanosecond um, speed. Okay. Yeah, that looks to actually be 120. Now, second for the 12, I would suspect. And so going through, um, continuing on, uh, this is where the, okay, that's the reinstallation. So let's get back to, we went through page two, uh, number three. It's got the little warranty uh, slip inside here and just shows how to go through and to raise the keyboard up and put in position. I had, I seem to have a little bit more trouble with this older LCD. So they may be referring to um, that newer backlit display and they're showing how to go through and insert the modules. You know, they're showing the, the little, um, kind of trying to highlight the the clips, as I say, in this time frame, just be aware that those clips are very brittle. And then going through and putting the system back together and getting the battery back in place. Um, they don't show a number nine for connecting the power again. But... Um, That's what there is to the you know, checking or going through and uh, normally going through and adding more RAM 
uh, you can see the little steps here. You put the the keyboard on the top. And it's got little cutouts for the the sketch drive buttons, and that just goes through and pushes down the front to be able to latch. Um, let's go through and just as it is, I want to pause. I want to get out one of the um, the other displays just to see if there's any difference. Okay, and I don't really see any difference as far as the latching for the, the backlit display where it's got the two. Uh, it doesn't seem like there's any, any, any difference on, in latching. I was just remembering it was easier at uh, at the time before to go through, and when she brought that keyboard up to to nestle it in, and it just it just basically locked in, no matter the the tilt on this, uh, to be held very secure as you're underneath the, in the keyboard tray. And of course, if you went through and increased the the RAM, you would see that. The next time you powered the system up, it'd go through and count um, the memory, and you could, if any difficulty, you could see. I don't know if there's any, uh, in a sense, a uh, memory-related um, images that come up. I, I suppose there would have to be uh, with the system doing its uh, its post check. It would just be kind of interesting to check on that at times. And there is a little bit of um, that static RAM on the planer as well, uh, just to mainly hold the machine state for that suspend operation. And, um, and of course, like I said, that's assuming that it you have a, a power source, you have a, a, a good battery, or it's connected up to the wall voltage, like is very typical today with the bad battery packs. But that really kind of covers it all. I covered a lot of the details I want to, to look at, and I'll, of course, include that link in the video description to where the the information that page at the art and tool that I have on that background monitor is at so people can go through and look that over for themselves. I'll try and go through and find the image for um, that. Uh, in fact, I probably have it up in my web space and I can go through and link that in as well so people can see that up close and personal as I went through and scanned it previously. I know I did, I've got pictures of the memory configurations and showing how things are as well. So if you enjoyed the video, go ahead and click on that like button, please. And as always, consider subscribing to my channel if you've not done so already and tell your friends to subscribe to really get that subscriber count going up. But this is IBM Museum. That's all I have for now. Thank you.